This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, it's Friday at 4 o'clock. It's life in the law we're doing now. It could be bigotry in America, too. That's you know, perfectly, perfectly appropriate to call it either way. And my co-host for this discussion here on life in the law, <laughs> Marsha Joyner. Hi, Marsha. Hi. Yeah. And our special well, guest. Okay, she, introduce she our guest. Our special you? guest, since we are talking about the law, um, is one of Hawaii's esteemed, I think that's the right <laughs> word, attorneys, and just an absolutely delightful young lady, and uh, comes from a long line of attorneys and important people. <laughs> uh, this is Daphne Barbie Wooten. She also has a brother who is practicing law. Yes. And a husband who is practicing law and all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> well, Welcome thanks. to the show, Daphne. <laughs> thank you for having me. Nice to have you here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's go a little further. So you're practicing in Hawaii? Yes. You're practicing civil rights law, you told me? Yes, yeah, yeah. I am. And you have a private practice where yes. you handle clients who have claims in civil rights. Yeah? That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. What an interesting practice that must be. It's fascinating. You meet yeah. all kinds of people, all kinds of situations, and um, unfortunately, discrimination is alive and well in Honolulu and in Hawaii. Well, you know, the problem is we live in a world where we haven't gotten away from that. You know, as we're still in the 19th century, I'm sorry, yes. maybe the 18th century. Yes. Uh, and, and, and as much as you would like to think that Hawaii uh, is a completely you know, polyglot um, place, uh, there's discrimination here, too. There it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's probably more subtle than, let's say, in, a, in the South, in the United States, but it's here, and there, the subtleties are... Well, she's the attorney, so those are the things that are hard to prove because <laughs> the judge doesn't understand the subtleties, doesn't see the subtleties. Yeah. I, am I? That is true. However, there are some blatant, like sex harassment cases yes. that one would think the judges <laughs> should get, <laughs> um, but maybe they don't. Um, and that's not necessarily racial. That's just gender. Huh? That's gender, but gender is also a. a, a type of discrimination. Sure. You have equal pay and sex um, yeah, yeah. discrimination. And so it is included within the discrimination realm and civil rights realm. But the, as far as racial discrimination, it also exists here in Hawaii. Um, sometimes it is very blatant. How does it visit itself? What kinds of cases have you seen? <clears throat> Don't name any names. I can't name any names. I know names. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can also look up the cases. Um, I know I represented one man. Um, and this is actually his ancestry rather than um, race, but um, he was called all kinds of names at his job, uh, making references to his ancestry, which was French. And so many people said, well, you can't have discrimination because of your French ancestry, but it's absolutely true. You can have uh, discrimination because you're Portuguese. Um, and so it's, it's not just African-Americans or Africans or um, Filipinos, although I do note that most of the people who have called for discrimination on the basis of race, at least in my office, tend to be Filipino and African American. Mm. Um, but again, you know, it's unfortunate. You have to educate not just the employers, but you have to educate judges as well as to the subtleties of discrimination in Hawaii. You know, um, uh, there was a time when everybody came off the plantations and there were multiple races, you know, in the society, and they all made fun of each other. They made caricatures of each mm -hmm. other, you know. There were certain characteristics that were just generally considered humorous. What? And I remember, uh, gee, I'm blocking on his name, uh, but one of the comedians, great comedians, and Waikiki local comedian, he made a living. <laughs> making jokes like this. And at the time, talking about the 60s and 70s, it was very funny. Now, somewhere along the line, and I thought, and all my friends thought this was funny, um, now we've come to a time where he could not make a living doing that. It would be politically incorrect. But don't you think there's room for humor? Isn't well, humor a If a black man is called the N-word, it's not that's funny. That's not humor. No, uh, that's, that's not, not that. humor. But, but, you know, even on the plantation, we tend to think of Japanese as being Japanese, but the Okinawans and the 
mainland Japanese are two different people and on the plantation they were separated and didn't want to be called each other. So that there's the kinds of things that those of us that come from someplace else don't know those differences. Uh, even with the, quote, Portuguese that come from the islands of Madeira and uh, the Canary Islands are different than the Portuguese that come from Portugal. Yeah. So, but, you know, these kinds of things for people that come from someplace else don't see these differences, but they see the difference. They know the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my only point is that um, that when the various races came off the plantations, um, they, they had this kind of cultural tradition of making fun, and it was truly fun. It was not meant in any way to be nasty or racist. It was just fun. Um, and, you know, while they made their jokes, um, their daughters married, you know. I mean, it was, so it was, intermarried, uh, yeah. Uh, intermarried. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they, they, so they might make a joke against the other guy's race, but then he could be their son-in-law, too. Mm -hmm. And they would welcome him in, into the family because that was what was happening. It was all coming together in Hawaii. Well, uh, I know I, one case that I had, and I can't talk about it because it's public record, is in um, Kalahia High School, the yearbook case. Um, three African-American students won a song contest, and under the caption of the photo in the yearbook, it said, I like pig's feet, and I like de hog malls. And it was very racist <laughs> and upsetting to the parents and the children to see that this was placed into That's a yearbook. Funny. It wasn't funny, but uh, other people laughed and thought it was funny, so we sued, and we got a settlement in federal court. Um, but a lot of people didn't get it. They didn't realize that this was referring to slavery days when African Americans as slaves had to eat low on the hog, not high on the hog, and had to eat this type of food, you know, for survival. Yeah. And they didn't understand the context. And we found out that it was a student, non-African American, who placed the caption there. Um, Ignorant. That, yeah, yeah. But it, it had a harmful effect on. Well, I mean, the part of, you're part of your job yeah. in, in doing civil rights law, and you were doing the EEOC there for a while. You told me um, is to make the make the point to educate people especially corporations that have leverage in larger capital concentrations, that this is really not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And if we want to live together in harmony, we have to avoid, you know, what's the word, insulting people and uh, de degrading them, their, their position in, in the society. And so um, it's, it's more than just a settlement. Right. It's more than just a punishment. Because um, the settlement could be a punishment. And it <laughs> yeah. depends a punishment. on how big it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the notion of saying, uh, you know, you, you guys have to consider what you're doing. Uh, right. You have to be more, uh, my word, you have to be more decent, more gentle. Well, that's a good word. More yeah. understanding and um, sensitive. I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Culturally sensitive yeah. and be more aware. Yeah. I mean, it's an opportunity to educate yourself before you start spewing out stereotypes against yeah. another yeah. person. That does, that does not undermine the, the, the humor of some statements, though. I don't know. You're not going to agree with me. <laughs> I have to hear the statement first. Okay, right. No, it's fair. That's fair. But there are laws. The thing is that people who do this in the workplace, maybe they go to a bar and, and they tell racial jokes. I don't know. But in a workplace or in school or education, there are actual laws, civil rights laws, which say that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race or ancestry um, or sex. And so that's the thing, is that if you're in a setting, such as an educational setting or well, a workplace, you do have to obey Where it law. has an effect. I mean, you know, I think there's two things. One is talk, <laughs> and you could make the statement that sometimes talk is you not know, just talk. But when you take action, when you don't promote somebody, when you terminate somebody, when you, you know, don't pay somebody as much money as the other person, then there's actual action there, and that's different, right? No, words hurt. I knew words. she wasn't going to be with you. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, words are words. Words, 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 words. You know. <laughs> just, just look every morning at, at your president. Those words hurt. He well, tweets, let's talk about that. He Is tweets it? all kinds of things. Let's talk about things. that. It seems yeah. to me that in this country, and I'm not limiting this to racial either. It's religious as well. Yeah. And in terms of racial, it's all kinds of races are, are being, uh, you know, insulted and uh, subject to discrimination and um, and very un unpleasant things, uh, unpleasant maybe a euphemism. Um, uh, in this administration since January 20th, do you have any information on that? Uh, can I 
Right, right, right. <laughs> Do I have information on the 45? That's who I call the president is 45. I don't know what that um, is. That's, that's the 45th number. president. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, about I, you do not mention his name. He is merely 45. <laughs> well, I recall him making uh, a tweet um, when the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists at, at Charlottesville were marching, and um, a car ran into a woman who was uh, pro-civil rights. Killed um, her. And I think it's murder, as you absolutely killed her. And the president says, well, you know, we have decent people on yeah. the side of the boys will be man. boys, yeah. Um, that was extremely, uh, it, it's beyond insensitive. I thought it was an endorsement of white supremacy. And um, basically, I felt as though his tweet was in favor of what happened with the KKK, in favor of white supremacy, and shutting down civil rights protesters and this young woman who um, wasn't doing anything illegal, um, doing her First Amendment rights, and she was murdered. She was killed. And uh, her last words on Facebook, Facebook were, stay woke. If you are not outra outraged, stay awake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but have you noticed, uh, um, one Go more ahead. question, Marcia, then I'll, <laughs> no, no, I'll no, let you have this about witness. About yeah. About the same, <clears throat> same 45. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, who's going first? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Daphne, my question really is, has there been an increase in racial tension? Has there been an increase in racial discrimination since January 20th and number 45? Yes, I believe there has been. Well, why, Just, do you, why do you say uh, that? Well, uh, look at the way he treats Colin Kaepernick, for example, who's uh, kneeling in his First Amendment rights. Um, to draw attention to the way black men have been systematically killed by unarmed black men, systematically killed by the police. Um, he, I think, contacted the owners. Um, he got Goodell um, of the NFL to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be kneeling. And he didn't, and basically he was saying those athletes who are predominantly African American, um, who are kneeling to um, bring attention to the unfairness of what's happening with African American males getting shot. Yeah, absolutely. That it's clear. He's yeah, and so what he's doing is making people pick sides, and he has successfully gotten some of the owners to say you have to stand, um, saying that those who don't stand have to be fired. That's a major lawsuit right there. Okay. And yes, I do notice that there are higher racial tensions under. 45. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Marcia, your witness. Yes. <laughs> November 7th, was it, or 8th, whatever the day was, the very next day in Hawaii Kai, I went to get my car washed and I had yet to pay $10. This last year. This after was the, the election day after November. the election. November 4th. Almost a year ago. Yeah. Okay. But so I walked in the door with my bill in my hand to pay for the car wash. And there are people in line. So I just stand there, and the local guy said, Oh, Auntie, come on, come on, you can get in. And the Howley guy behind said, You are no longer in charge. We are in charge now. Oh, what does that tell you? I thought, Oh, already? Already? <laughs> 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 you know, it's coming so soon. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, my goodness. But, but the one closer that I noticed that nobody on the media saw, and I was here, I did a commentary on it. The president did not, when he talked to the widow, uh, mm -hmm. just a couple weeks ago, he never once mentioned her name, Mrs. Johnson. Every culture has a Johnson. It's not a strange name. He never once said Mrs. Johnson, not once. The Congress lady, never, never. All of the media, which are white, did not see that not once were those two women ever addressed as Mrs. Now, in the South, mm -hmm. no white man calls a black woman Mrs. It isn't done. Why, why not? I mean, what is it? That's, so, they... that's just so racism it's, I'm telling you about. It's, it's part of the, um, the slavery legacy. They don't call African-American men by their names, or if they do, it's the first name, um, and as boy. opposed to Mr. Johnson yeah. um, and boy. And uh, they don't want to acknowledge that they're on equal status, status. And the same for women. They don't call African-American women Mrs. Johnson. Mm -hmm. They'll call her... Um, 
They did Gladys or whatever the yeah. first name is. Um, right. Did, than did, did, did I call you Daphne? You can call me Daphne. Thank yeah. You. Okay. <laughs> but he didn't. Know. He that's didn't even do that. <laughs> but, but what annoyed me, what really bothered me, was listening to all the commentators, and none of them noticed. And it was only that oh. I did the commentary we, here. We have to I, do critical thinking when we see this happening. Well, that's what we I did to, the commentary, and I had to say that see look, sea changes. this yeah. is this is as subtle racism, and it is there, and none of the media saw it. That's and then they wondered why she was upset. We need more, more diversity and viewpoints in the and media. We, and it's scary because I'm, uh, my understanding is the media now is getting to be a monopoly. Yeah. There are fewer of them all the time. Oh, so uh, before we take, we'll oh, take oh, a break, that's a whole different subject. I do <laughs> want to ask you one question, and I, and I, I know the answer is you know, very long, but uh, see if you can give me a succinct answer in one minute. Okay. What do we do? Keep talking. Vote. Organize. Vote. Organize. Right. And um, encourage other people, educate and encourage them to um, understand the subtleties of racism and why it harms us as a nation. And that if we can eradicate it, I think our nation would be much greater and better. We have to do that. Right. Yeah. And one of the things you didn't mention is we have to make movies. <laughs> okay. Yes, and, we do. And that's why. Right after this break, we're going to examine the Thurgood Marshall movie that's playing right now in Honolulu. Okay. One short break. We'll be right back to do that. <laughs> Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by and hear from some of the best investment minds across the globe. And real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds managers, all of that great stuff. Thank you. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Okay, we're back. We're live. You should have been here during the break. It was a pretty interesting break. <laughs> Sorry, but that's the way it goes. Okay, <clears throat> maybe we'll change the system so everybody can watch the breaks too. I don't know if you'd want that. <laughs> okay, so here we're, we're here with uh, Daphne Bobby Wooten. Yes. Okay, she's an attorney, a civil rights attorney here in Honolulu. And, um, and Marsha, Marsha Joyner, who is my co-host here and her, a host in her own right. Not one, not two, but like three shows a week. And I don't know how she does it. It's in the vitamin pills. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 79 and the end is, you can see the end. So I got a lot to do. Not for you, not for you, Marsha. <laughs> I got a lot to do to get him before the Okay, we promise them when okay, we get, we get to Marshall. Let's go back. Because Marshall is a movie that actually goes beyond the movie. You know, if you thought that the movie Marshall, and I've only seen the trailer, but I watched it a couple times, uh, if you thought that Marshall was a, you know, like a Marshall 101 type of movie, it's not. It's about one case. It's about a case before he ascended the Supreme Court bench. It's about a case in Connecticut, not in the South. It's about a case where, where he really, it, it was a funny movie in many ways. There's a lot of humor there. Maybe, maybe, you know, cutting humor, but humor nevertheless. Um, where he he defended this guy who was charged with what attacking rape, rape. raping a rape. white socialite woman. She he and, was African American. He was black and she was white. That's yeah. that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And she's and, a very wealthy woman. Very wealthy woman, in Connecticut. They have that. Um, and this is the story of that trial. And uh, he was you know he's not a judge at this time. He was a trial lawyer. And you get to see what, what he was all about. He was a really good trial lawyer. That's what I got out of it. Well, well here's the thing about that you didn't know about the movie, is he was there for the NAACP to make sure that the um, accused got a fair trial, a good attorney. And the judge would not let Thurgood Marshall be his lawyer just to sit next to a lawyer who had never done a criminal case in his life. He wasn't but, gonna take that, was right. he? <laughs> well, Thurgood Marshall was able to mentor and talk to the lawyer was and make him- Friedman. Yes. Friedman was get the name him, of the lawyer. Yeah, yeah, I think he did business law. <laughs> but he <laughs> took that insurance. Yeah, 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 yeah,
Should I say the end of the movie? Maybe you no, should go see the movie. No, that's okay. See the movie. Go no, see the movie. See the movie. Let me did, tell did you. he get him off? I, I no, 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 let's don't, no spoil. We're no not going to spoil the movie. But you know Thurgood Marshall is always going to be the hero. So he's a hero. That gives okay. you a hit. All right, gives you a hit. All right. But for me, I was, well, of course we know the ending. But for me, to watch the growth of the Jewish attorney that Thurgood Marshall was mentoring, and to watch him, I thought was, that uh, was, Again, back to the subtleties, but you could see him grow. And in, in understanding the subtleties of racism, and in, of course, it takes time, place during the World War II, so they had to throw in a couple of things with the Nazis for him to get that this is the same <laughs> right. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that was so interesting, the way that developed gradually, little by little, so that by the time we get to the end, he is a great attorney. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And yeah. and you will also note, for those who should go see it, I think everybody should go see it, there are some high-profile people there. The lawyer who um, represented Trayvon Martin's family is at the end, mm -hmm. <laughs> shaking Thurgood Marshall's, oh, Chadwick Boseman's hand as Thurgood Marshall, saying, we need you, we need more of you. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if you know who's in there, there's a couple of people I actually recognized, um, uh, NAACP <laughs> and on the front line. So they were uh, doing bit parts. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. really great. And, and yeah. to set the stage that you had Duke Ellington and all of the, the great entertainers of that era, so that it, it gives you a, set, a time frame mm -hmm. so that you get to see the entertainers, you get to see the Nazis, so you understand this is World War II, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, this generation knows nothing, so I don't know that they'll well, get Well, but you have to see in history, and I, I mentioned to you before the show that the movie, so, so far as I could appreciate it through the trailer, reminded me of the article uh, not too long ago about uh, Donald Trump's number 45's father, uh, yes. okay, who, who lived in Long Island somewhere, and who was arrested for being part of a uh, uh, Ku Klux Klan uh, right. a demonstration of some kind, and um, and you know, and that that was a surprise. I mean, I grew up in New York, and it never happened while I was there. Uh, but back in the 30s and the 40s, it was a different place. Really was. And you know, if you thought that there was no racism in, in the northeast of the country in those days, think again. Uh, and, and both of those stories, the one about Donald Trump's father, imagine the, the Ku Klux Klan in Long Island, what? We had a major <laughs> and, and here this, this down kind of case, it's a true case. Yes. This movie is a true story case. Yes, it's it true, is a story. It's about a, a racial trial in Connecticut, of course. Right. Connecticut. Right. Um, so, I mean, it teaches you about the history. And I think, I think we, to your point, Marsha, we really have to understand the historical context for all of us. We have to understand it, we have to study it, we have to draw it forward, we have to see the sea changes, and, and I hope we don't have to repeat it. Oh, I hope one not. of the other subtleties in the movie is where all of these black entertainers were. Langston with Hughes. Langston Hughes, and all of them are in a beautiful nightclub, but of course, they were segregated. Even in New York City, and blacks entertain at the Cotton Club, but right. you can't eat, you can't come in. Yeah. You know, you could entertain, but you couldn't okay. sit and enjoy. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, one other thing I want to mention about the movie, um, it was brought, to, we went to a special screening, the ACLU um, presented it for certain people, and they brought in Thomas Marshall, who, Thurgood Mar who is Thurgood Marshall's son, and a co-writer of the movie. And so after we saw the movie, we were able to ask them questions. And of course, the big question for um, Thomas Marshall is, what is it like growing up with your father and what was his favorite case? And he said, you know, everybody thinks that Brown versus Board of Education was my father's favorite case. That was his big win at the Supreme Court before he became a justice. Yes, um, and that integrated the public schools, 54, 54. 54. May 1954. But who's counting? 
But his son, yeah, his son said, no, that wasn't his favorite case. His favorite case was when he got out of law school. He had applied to the University of Maryland Law School. They wouldn't accept him because he was black. And so he had to go to Howard Law School. When he got out of law school, Howard Law School, and worked for the NAACP, his first case was a case against the University of Maryland Law School <laughs> for um, racial discrimination, and he won. And he, he, he just walked around that proudly that that was his favorite case. You know, he said, one day I'm going to sue that law school for not admitting me, and he did it, and he won. So it was kind of interesting. Yeah, there's really a lot of stories. That, that There's a lot of movies that can be made about Thurgood Marshall's life. Um, about the cases that he handled. It's just really, it was really fascinating. Well, the movie portrays him as a, a pretty witty guy. Oh, yes. And he had a great way of coming back at you. And he had great presence, great strength, great acuity, actually, and a sense of humor. And yes, he did. <laughs> oh, yes, he did. Now, and what I like most, because, you know, we went to this special screening, is that the young man that played Marshall does not look anything like him. So immediately, there's no comparison. You you immediately get into the story and not look at, oh, that's not what he looked like. That's not, you know, there was none of that. You really got into the story. The actor was superb. You really got to the story and not those things that, that's not the man I remember. That's not, you know, none now, of that. Now, the story, uh, the story I, my, again, I didn't see the movie, but, uh, but from the trailer, I got the idea that he was, he, as the lawyer, this defendant in this case, he was threatened. Oh yes, the right both were, were made. Oh, they yeah. both were threatened. Mm -hmm. the, he and I mean, the Jewish he and the attorney. Jew and, and there was violence, or threat of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, t tell me about it. Tell me what happened there, because this is not, this is not, doesn't happen in Connecticut very much. But, but on the steps, on the courthouse steps, there are other Jews upset with the Jewish attorney for what he's doing, for, for, for taking the case. Mm -hmm. That's you know? right. Mm -hmm. that, oh, yeah. Now, the, we didn't see the... That, yeah, there was one part of violence. But, yes, well, he they, was beat up. They were yeah. beat up, followed around, um, mm -hmm. hit and attacked. Um, yeah. The Jewish lawyer's home was, you know, the, the wife was threatened. And um, Thurgood Marshall, of course, was threatened and beat up. He was actually beat up. Oh, yeah. Well, in the movie. In now, the movie. We don't know for sure what happened. Right, because when the co-writer uh, answered questions... He admitted that he put yeah, a, he little, some license he that. a little artistic <laughs> license in that. And, of course, if you read just the transcript, you're not going to see that, see that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. there were no transcripts yeah. of the court, the yeah. court proceedings. Remember that the attorney, I meant the writer, mm -hmm. said that there were no transcripts. Oh, in those days, a court no, of record was not necessarily a court of record. <laughs> and, and, of course, because it was already set up, the prosecutor attorney was... The son of the judge's best friend, best partner, friend. Law, partner. law partner. So they were already going to crucify this guy. It was already set up so, to do that. You know, it, it strikes me that um, going back to our discussion before the break, you know, what do we do? Well, we try to elevate guys like this mm -hmm. and we try to get them on the Supreme Court. We need another third grade marshal, that's yes, what we, we need. Do. And I sure, or, or an Obama to run for office and actually be a leader in the country. Right. And I wonder how he achieved. An appointment, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. And there's no fickle finger coming down from God to well, appoint you to Supreme LB, Court. He was, he was uh, first of all, he was Solicitor General, General the first African American Solicitor General. Mm -hmm. LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was the president that passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And he had um, elevated Thurgood Marshall from Solicitor General to a um, judgeship. It was a um, U.S. judgeship, but of course it wasn't Supreme Court. I think it was a district in court Washington. in Washington, D.C. And then from there, he appointed him to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah, so LBJ really stuck his neck out, and he um, well, did his he, homework. He, he was the power. He was the hand. Um, of course, everybody had a part into it, but he was the one that wrote, signed the civil rights legislation, got it passed, by talking to people um, and, and twisting their arms and making it work. And he's the one that got um, Thurgood Marshall up there on the Supreme Court. He was, in this way, LBJ was enlightened. He, he was, did some he good was. stuff. Mm -hmm. He should have gone down as one of the greats if he hadn't gotten mixed up in that war. Yeah, Vietnam. I agree. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that the Vietnam War was not good for anybody. Everybody so, lost. what do you guys see for the future on this issue? On Thurgood Marshall, um, on 
we call it media treatment of the racial discrimination issue in this country. Um, what do you see for healing the wounds that are happening right now, by the way? Um, what do you see for the future? Well, I would like to see, um, as far as the media, more um, fairness in the way they treat racial issues. Um, there's this movie I suggest you go see. It's called Who's Streets? And it's a viewpoint of African-American filmmakers of what happened in Ferguson. And it paints a much different uh, picture of what happened than if you see in the, the mainstream media, which says, oh, these are riots, these are thugs running around, you know, uh, breaking in buildings. And in that one, it showed how um, uh, the police treated people who were protesting the killing of Michael Brown. They showed the body of Michael Brown laying in the street after he had been shot by the police and them disregarding people to try to come and help Michael Brown. Uh, it was an media? excellent how, movie. How did the media conduct themselves? Oh, it was terrible. They just basically portrayed it as a, a riot and black people running amok, when in reality it wasn't. And they showed in the documentary Whose Street, which may come up for an Academy Award, uh, which actually was shown at the Doris Duke Theater here in Honolulu. <laughs> right, okay. um, and actually the stars, some of the stars came and, and, and the producer came. Right. But um, it just painted a totally different picture and viewpoint as to what's going on racially in America. And also in that it also showed how people did come together, um, whites and, and women came together to support the protesters. Um, so my hope is that the young people do not carry a bigoted or prejudicial, prejudicial mindset, that they're more open-minded, and that it's good to have friends of different races and cultures and religions and sexes, and it's good to be more open in society and not be blindly um, ignorant of other people, uh, not caring about other people's cultures, and to really reach a hand, grab out, and let's do this together because we're all Americans. Let's make America great. Oh, yeah. And I guess I'm sounding like Obama. <laughs> <laughs> but locally, you asked, there was a young man, black young man, that was supposedly killed somebody. His friend, another black man, is telling why this kid didn't do it. His picture, he's not part of the crime. They showed his picture everywhere. So if you were just looking, you would think he was the one that created the crime. They don't do that with other people. If it's, you can always tell who did it by whose, you know, whose pictures they show. implication, yeah. And it was yeah. totally crucified this guy and he wasn't there. He yeah, was just yeah. defending his friend. Yeah. Daphne, I want to ask you one more question that I'm curious about. One more. <laughs> um, okay. Might be one following that. You know, this is like in a courtroom thing. Yeah. Right? One more question, Judge. Well, maybe one more after that. <clears throat> you're in the law. I mean, and you're in the law. You're in cutting edge kinds of things, uh, and you can feel. You know, you can feel the law. You can feel how it is and how it works and how it maybe should be. And I. I wonder if you're satisfied with the state of the law in this country, in this state, on racial discrimination. Um, if I made you queen for a day, <laughs> what would you change in the law, mm. if anything? Well, uh, you know, actually, that's an, a very good question. Um, let's see. I would not allow people who don't want jury duty so easy to get off the of jury duty. Um, so that includes doctors. I for the CEOs, they can't just say I'm too busy for this. They have to sit with the person who's, who's a janitor or a school teacher, and it can't just be school teachers on the jury. So the jury would have to be diverse, and I would make it diverse. Um, you know, if it, if it came in one specific group, great group, for example, if an African American defendant is there and there's no blacks on the jury pool, I tell the people, you go out, uh uh, you find somebody. You find it's to more than somebody. It's a democratization it's a process. Yeah. We're all in this together. Right. We don't have to work at it together. Right. Yeah. And it says a jury <laughs> of your peers. peers. Yeah. So if there's not one there, that's not your yeah, peers. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so that's one of the things I would do at least. Um, I mean, that's just the beginning, right? Um, I would make judges. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the judges would have to be more diverse. They can't just be from one 
from the business or the prosecutors or the U.S. attorneys. They have to come from all walks, all different types of lawyers. You need to put a civil rights attorney there as a judge. You can't just pick your friends, you your judge? buddies. I don't know. They haven't. Also, here's what else we changed. There is an age limit in the state of Hawaii 70. for judges. 70. Okay. I'm not there yet. It's true. But I know a lot of good people who may be 65 or getting close to 70. Yeah. I would I would stop that law. Look, a person can be as incompetent at 30 years old as 70 years old. <laughs> and a 70-year-old can be much more brighter than some of these 25-year-olds. Look at Marsha. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, that should stop. It's elemental. It's age discrimination. It so is. it's not how old you are. It's how you think, how you uh, speak, and how you conduct yourself that's more important than when you were born. Last question. Okay. I know you're not finished with answering that, but I, 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 you're a civil rights lawyer. Yes. Um, are there other civil rights lawyers like you in Hawaii now? There are. Yeah. Do you want How to name them? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, there's a group called National Employment Lawyers Association. Neela, shout out to you. Um, African American Lawyers Association, shout out to you. We're small, though. I, I have to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, Neela, active members, maybe in Hawaii, six? Uh. And uh, I also um, do EEO law on the mainland and, and Merit System Protection Board, and there's probably only three of us that do that. Uh, that's a small number for yeah. how many attorneys in Hawaii? Maybe 5,000, 6,000? Yeah. Small number. And the same is for the well, African American Lawyers Association. There's only a few of us. Um, so it's very small percentage, at least here. However, we hook up with mainland groups who are much larger um, and uh, are engaged in civil rights changes. National Bar Association is a group of African-American lawyers, African-American judges, very powerful organization, and they come here periodically. Also seek legislation, aside from litigation. Oh, absolutely yeah. seek le legislation, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And, yeah. and there are some senators in Hawaii who are very helpful in the civil rights arena. Yeah. Um, so Nice to meet you today. Yeah. Daphne, it's great. Well, thank Marcia, you. I'm going to give you a chance to summarize everything we've covered here <laughs> and to thank Daphne for appearing, okay? Uh, to summarize, what, four, 400, 500 years? Come on. Ooh, what about reparations, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 Legislation for reparations. Reparation. Yes. <laughs> the slavery was the most economical adventure ever, what the riches that it brought to America. Unbelievable. And so Daphne is one of those that has been in the trenches working day and night to somehow... End the Civil War. Well, well, yeah, the end of the Civil War, but more than just that. Um, to, to bring bring a new... A way of thinking. Civilization. Of yes. Yeah, more, new civilization. Yeah. Or more, in my opinion, more advanced, where it's not the color of your skin or the sex. It's yeah. what you bring to the table. Yeah, we need to do that. Yeah. We need to do that. And I am very proud of this young lady. I have known her since she arrived in Hawaii. Her husband did my hair at first when I first arrived. <laughs> Remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> and he said to tell you hello. Hi, kid. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday. <laughs> we're going to wrap this oh, up. Sorry. I'm sorry. But I am it's so, okay. I am so proud to watch her grow into this beautiful attorney that takes on cases that other people won't or can't, whichever the case may be, and to continue to do that, to stand for, to stand for what's right. Constantly, you can count on her. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you for introducing thank us, you, for bringing Daphne on the show. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Much, it was Daphne very nice coming. to meet Great you. It was a good conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna go Wonderful. Out and see that movie now. Yeah. Yes, oh, please do. do. Yes, you do. Aloha, yes. ladies. Aloha. <laughs>